If you would like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. More information in the description below. That poor girl. Link can't let it go. What happened to her? What took the light from her eyes? There's a land to save. Termina is sickly and dying. Time is running out once again. But Romani Ranch, it's so troubling to him. But he can't forget why he's here. He's supposed to be the hero of Termina, right? And he has to deal with the salesman. Get the mask back, not save some girl on a ranch. What would the smiling man say about that girl? Tick tock, tick tock, probably. But no. No, some things cannot be allowed, and he can't harden his heart to this. Link decides that he must go back to that ranch. As a Goron, he gained the ability to use massive powder kegs that can clear out the boulder blocking his way. This is a personal errand now. First up will be Romani Ranch. And here, in the late morning of the first day, things are far more peaceful and welcoming than before. The girl Romani, she runs around carefree with her little bow and arrow and cheerfully greets Link, who she nicknames Grasshopper because of his clothes. But then... Oh, a thousand yard stare overtakes Romani, and she tells Link that they are coming. They. They come at night, every year when the carnival approaches. They come riding in on a bright shining ball. A whole lot of them come down. And then they come to the barn. Well, this is an unexpected twist, and kind of unbelievable too. The young warrior girl proclaims that she must protect the cows against the invaders, but she needs an assistant. So Romani recruits Link, and after proving that he is handy with a bow and an arrow, she teaches Link Epona's song so that the two can practice and travel together. Hero and horse reunited. The world is a bit brighter now. Then Romani tells Link to come back that night at 2 a.m. to help her fight the invaders and to protect the cows. This has been an interesting turn of events, rather unexpected, but Link will absolutely come back here to aid in whatever this task is. Until then, however, Link and Epona can roam the fields of Termina together. On the ranch, they meet a strange man in a cuckoo shack named Grog, who seems viciously depressed. He knows the moon is going to fall, and his only regret in life is that he never got to see his baby cuckoos grow up. Poor guy. As the sun sets over Romani Ranch, the two sisters head inside for their supper and to settle in for the night. Young Romani will be sneaking out in a few hours, but it gives Link time to scope out a spot to perch on. The girl has said that they would be defending the barn, but it's hard to get a good visual of the fields and the barn. And what did she mean by all of that anyways? Who is going to be coming for the barn? Undead Gorons? Zombie Deku? The boy has a few hours to mull over all the possibilities. Maybe she meant bandits, or a pack of raving mad cuckoos. The cuckoos would actually be scarier than the bandits. Right at 2 a.m., the girl sneaks out of the main house and runs for the barn. It's showtime. And at 2.30 a.m., lights enter the fields from the sky. Aliens or ghosts? Alien ghosts are coming straight for the barn. No doubt they want some of that sweet, sweet Chateau Romani milk. And I mean, who can blame them? There are a few joys greater in life than getting blitzed off of milk. These are the they that Romani knew would be coming for the cattle. And for all the rest of the night, Link runs about the house, rooftop, and around the barn to shoot the invaders, with the trusty ranch dog there to help keep track of them. Around and around they go, with waves never ceasing in their approach. When one goes down, another pops up to take its place. Safety will come with the sunrise if you can just hold out against them. Romani is in the barn protecting the cattle, but if even one gets through, then it's game over. The girl is not a trained combatant. He has to keep them all away from the building. After hours of shooting and chasing, finally, finally, the sunrise vanquishes the invaders. He actually did it. Romani Ranch is safe. No harm came to the girl or the cows, thank goodness. Romani rewards Link with a bottle of their signature milk, along with directions on how precisely one drinks milk, and then she quickly hurries back inside before her big sister wakes up. With the road out of the ranch open and nothing amiss on the property, Kremia can deliver a shipment of their milk to Clocktown. She will be heading out after her work is done at about 6 o'clock that night. And she invites Link to join her on the wagon ride, if he would like. He doesn't really need transport around, but it sounds like a pleasant experience. And maybe he can help her out. You know, if something should come up. So sure, why not? This cycle is dedicated to Romani Ranch, so Link hangs out until that evening. And at 6 p.m. sharp, Kremia is waiting outside the barn with a loaded up wagon, ready to start their journey to Clocktown. 
It's a calm night, a pleasant scene to help Link find some peace with everything that he's experienced thus far. It's just a simple wagon ride into town, and he's there to just be company and an extra set of hands should Kremia need help. Epona will stay with Romani to help guard the property, just until Kremia returns, and they'll be fine. During the trip, Kremia opens up to Link a bit about the death of their father, the difficulties running the ranch, she has a lot of responsibilities to attend to running that place, and she's trying to raise her sister. Vandalism has been taking place, Romani has been learning to use weapons, and goes on about ghosts, the moon has her deeply concerned, her friend Anju is supposed to be getting married the next day, but will the moon fall? There's a plethora of things to worry over right now, and to top it all, the road into town has been gated shut. The path is blocked, and it should not be. Someone did this intentionally. Kremia tells him to get his bow ready. They're going to detour into foul country. Gates continue to force them along a path that Kremia does not like. It has them both on edge. They're going around the property of the Gorman brothers, and if Kremia's concerns speak to anything, it's that this is not a safe place to be. Two masked men wielding pitchforks attack the wagon and give chase. It is blatant who these men are, the Gorman brothers. I mean, they have signs all over their property and along the solitary road. Why even bother trying to conceal their faces? Kremia has been victim to acts of vandalism at the ranch, and these are the two responsible. They ride strange mules, attacking the wagon to attack the product in the back, intent on breaking every bottle they can reach. But they weren't expecting Kremia to have a bodyguard. As they draw in, Link unloads arrows into them to push them back. All through the wild country road they chase, relentless and malicious in their intention. But their pursuit breaks once Kremia gets them beyond the Gorman property. What terrible, cruel, awful, gross men. Kremia is beyond gracious to Link for his help. She sings to him praises and thanks, then gifts him the Ramani's Mask, a very special item that will get him entrance to the milk bar Latte in Clocktown. And those masks are only given out in extremely limited quantities, and it's an acknowledgement from Kremia that Link is a mature young adult. This is the end of his adventures with the Romani Ranch sisters, but he won't forget their kindness. He has some time left before he must reset time, so he takes a trip into Clocktown to check out that bar. Latte is very fancy indeed, and not a lot of people are in it. But there is a Zora here. His name is Toto, and he's the manager of the Indiegogos, except he's not here for happy reasons. Latte was going to be a performance venue for the band to perform at, but it was cancelled. He wished he could do a sound check, but there are too many spots on the stage that need filled and not enough link to fill them. Since there's not much happiness to be found in the bar, and <laughs> who would have thunk that bars could be depressing places, Link decides to take off early, leave the adults to their drinking. His time is starting to run short, and he has accomplished what he set out to do, but before departing the cycle, he drops by the laundry pool as the sweet siren call of a phonograph rings out. They said he was much too loud when he practiced in his room. They got mad. Now he's sad. He just thinks about the past to keep his mind off the bad. Long ago, this strange man was in an animal troop. Why could a, why could a, why could a man join? That's cause a man is an animal too. The animals in the troop were all great, but there was one thing he didn't like about it. Why was the, why was the, why was the dog the leader? Was there something wrong with him? The dog was an amazing leader. He led a stellar troop no matter the animal. That's why he, that's why he, that's why he stole it. The dog's mask. He wanted it because it was the leader's mask, but he no longer needs it, so he gives it to Link. And scene. This mask is meant to lead tiny animals. It will help them mature quickly into adults in an instant. And hey, that guy Grog back at Romani Ranch, didn't he want to see his baby cuckoos grow up before the moon fell? It's kind of morbid, but maybe Link can help do one more good thing this cycle. Make Grog happy. It's the morning of day three by the time Link gets back, plenty of time to test this theory out. He dons the Bremen mask, starts playing a tune, and marches around the cuckoo yard. One by one, each of the chicks follow Link around, and when he's gathered them all up, they start to mature into full-grown cuckoos. This was Grog's only wish, and Link made it come true. He's perfectly satisfied now, and gifts to Link the bunny hood. It will help him run super quick whenever he has it on. Well, it's time for Link to call it quits for this cycle. It's getting easier to accept that everything will be undone. He knows that he can't save everyone, he has to let it go, but seeing all the happiness he created this cycle, it restores some faith in what he's doing. He knows that the goal is stopping the moon, but maybe, just maybe, everything else will fall into place if he can do that. One step at a time. Harden your heart, hero.
a new cycle begins and it kicks off with a mistake. Link must go to the ocean to the west, but sometimes directions are hard. He goes east instead. He jumps a few barriers, but there's no clear way forward. The only thing in this little clearing is a conspicuous rock circle. The Lens of Truth reveals a lone, sad soldier named Shiro, who is so uninteresting that no one has ever stopped to talk to him before. He's been here for years, he says, waving his arms, asking for help. Link gives the poor guy a potion that will get him back on his feet, and to repay his kindness, Shiro gives to Link his mask, the Stone Mask, which will make him just as boring and uninteresting as Shiro. With his health restored and his mask cast aside, Shiro jumps to his feet and begins his journey in learning to stand out in the world. Link clearly wasn't meant to come this way, so he backtracks back to the fields of Termina and goes the proper direction towards the ocean. This is his first time at the seaside. It's deep, wide water as far as the eye can see. It seems pretty peaceful. Some boats and sunbathing spots are still set up. Nothing is apparently wrong. No poisonous waters, snowstorms, mice with bombs on their tails. While he's not quite familiar with the birds here, a group of them are flocked around something in the water, quite like vultures circling a dying creature. And they're above something that's bobbing in the water. That's concerning. Swimming out into the open waters, Link finds himself hauling a Zora out. The Zora are water-dwelling people, but this creature is so injured that he can't even get himself to the shore. He was stranded out in the water, weakly calling for help, but getting him to the beach isn't going to save his life. He's far beyond that point. It's a marvel that he can even walk once he's back on land. He doesn't make it very far before collapsing. This Zora is named Mikau, and he has only a few minutes of life left to explain his plight to Link, and he will do so in song. Mikau is the guitarist for a band called the Indiegogos. Their vocalist Lulu laid some eggs, but she lost her voice afterwards. And then, Mikau sings that the pirates stole Lulu's eggs, so in secret, he went to their fortress to get them back, only to be grievously wounded and tossed out, left for dead. His final request is for Lulu's eggs to be saved, and for his soul to be healed. It's all he can get out before once again collapsing. There's no getting up this time. As was done for Darmani, Link plays for Mikau the Song of Healing, to soothe his restless soul, so that he might pass on and leave his regrets behind. In Mikau's lingering moments before death, he sees Lulu. She's looking at him, recognizes him, the sadness gone from her eyes. And then the rest of the Indiegogos appear, ready to start a melody. Lulu takes Mikau's hand, and together they go to meet the band. This is where Mikau will stay and in his wake will be left a mask which will contain the spirit of a legendary Zora guitarist. This will allow Link to take on the visage of Mikau and all the abilities of Zora. He can now gracefully glide through water just as Mikau did in life. The home of the Zora is not far away, just on the other side of the cove. And just like the ocean outside, the water isn't poisoned or frozen or boiling or gone. Things here seem all right, it's just folks going about their day, with a stage being prepared in the middle of the hall for the Indiegogos. Link is recognized as Mikau, which gets him direct access to the band members, namely the leader of the band, Evan. The ocean is changing, it feels abnormal, possibly because there's trouble brewing at the Great Bay Temple. Descendants of the Zora Protector of the Temple are fated to be met with trouble when this happens, namely Lulu. Upon seeing Link as Mikau, Evan asks him if he got the eggs back and that he hasn't is distressing. Lulu has taken to standing outside, staring at the ocean, not attempting any communication anymore. Evan believes that if they can get her eggs back, her sadness will fade and her voice will return. He's kept her situation a secret, but the Indiegogos are supposed to be performing at Clocktown. The carnival is in just a few days. He won't be able to cover up the situation forever and believes that Mikau has the blood of a Zoran hero. He is the only one who can fix this. Link chases off a creepy stalker from Lulu's private room, and inside he finds her diary, which he reads with no hesitation, as though the dirtbag outside wasn't bad enough. But in her diary, Link discovers that Lulu took her eggs to the marine research lab at the behest of Evan after her voice faded away, just to have them checked out. It was after that trip that the pirates broke into her room and stole her eggs under the cover of night. Telling Mikau about the theft made her feel better, but he was the one person that she didn't want to tell. She was embarrassed and sad. She tried to keep it a secret. If Lulu knew what had become of Mikau, her heart would break all over again and anew. Lulu herself is standing outside the Zora Hall, all alone, staring out at nothing. She looks to him with recognition and a moment of hope, 
but seeing he's empty-handed, she loses the light in her eyes again. Like, she's trying to tell him something, but she just can't. After learning all of this, it feels like a heavy gloom is sitting over the ocean now, a stark contrast to the happy mood of Romani Ranch. Lulu's diary made mention of a marine research lab taking care of the eggs before they were stolen, so Link decides to drop in under the guise of Mikau to sniff out any more potential leads before taking off for a pirate fortress. And the elderly researcher is in fact expecting Mikau and the eggs, and that he doesn't have them yet is irritating to the old man. So, this is where they need to be delivered. He will take care of them, and he's expecting seven in total. Good to know. Up the coastline is that fortress. It's a massive complex, and it's well guarded by an all-female clan reminiscent of the Gerudo from Hyrule. If they spot Link, he'll be violently ejected. But to add complexity to the situation, there are traps to avoid all around the fortress. But it seems that fate has been on Link's side. That mask that he got from the wounded soldier, Shiro, it makes Link so plain, so uninteresting, that he's practically invisible while wearing it. And with the stone mask on, Link doesn't have to creep around the corridors dodging patrols. He just walks right past the guards. But even with the aid of the mask, this place is hard to make heads or tails of. There's not an egg in sight. But confusions are eased and more complications yet arise when Link comes across a heated moment between the leader of the pirates and one of her lieutenants. Three of the seven eggs were lost at sea when they were attacked by a massive sea serpent. Oh good, oh good. They originally took the eggs because the Skull Kid had told them that they were the key to getting into the Great Bay Temple, which is obfuscated by a dragon-shaped cloud. If they can get all seven together, then they'll be able to get into the temple and they'll find hidden treasure within. Of course, that's not true, but they believe the Skull Kid, and they'll do anything to get that supposed treasure, even steal a new mother's babies. Unfortunately, for the pirates that is, they're not the best at upkeep, because there's a bee's nest in that room and it sure would be a shame if somebody broke it especially since there's an egg in that room that they're guarding and some sort of a treasure. Oh golly darn, Link shot down the nest and oh no, everyone's fleeing. Anyways, the treasure in that room will come in handy. It's a hook shot. Link wielded this once upon a time as an adult, but it's perfectly workable in his child form as well, and it will aid him in collecting Lulu's precious eggs. Four are hidden within the fortress, three are someplace out at sea. Good. The prospect of deep sea diving is a bit terrifying, so for now, Link will spend some time here in the fortress just taking his time to clear it out, not because he's afraid of the dark water. It's just time consuming. One by one, he finds them spread out around the compound. They're guarded by well-trained pirates that would rather fight him than just throw him out in fair one-on-one -on -one combat. And each combatant he knocks out honorably leaves him to continue his search through the fortress rather than call him back up. By midnight, all four eggs are collected from the fortress and delivered to the Marine Research Lab for treatment and observation, which leaves three more, which were lost at sea after a massive sea snake attacked. Oh, good, 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 good. This is going to be awesome. Oh, good. Apparently, there is a sea snake nest at Pinnacle Rock. It's just visible off in the distance, so it's not terribly hard to find. Link saves a golden seahorse from a nearby fisherman, gaining him a personal guide through the murky waters of the ocean, but eventually he has to confront it. And it's deep into the night when Link finds it. A deep, dark hole in the ocean floor that's filled with nesting sea snakes. And every cavern has to be checked for an egg, starting from the top all the way down to the bottom. Each snake that Link passes by comes out to greet him with a thrashing head and a low moan. This is a get in and get out as quickly as possible kind of a situation, but the final three eggs are safely recovered and removed from the lair. All seven eggs are now safely under the care of the lab researcher. Wonderful news that can finally be delivered to Lulu. But to their surprise, they all begin to hatch. Little baby Zoros begin to flutter around the tank, and then yet another surprise. The little guys are all lined up to form the notes of a song that Link can learn. It will be called the New Wave Bossa Nova, a song meant to restore their mother's voice. The researcher urges Link to go find Lulu. Play this song for her. It's meant for her. In the form of Mikau, Link rushes to Lulu and plays for her the song her children created. And sure enough, something about it draws her voice out again. Lulu sings freely and joyously, accompanied by Mikau on guitar. The restoration of her voice awakens a nearby sea creature, a great turtle that acts as a sort of keeper to the Great Bay Temple. Though the turtle has slumbered for many years, he's still aware of the goings-ons within the ocean, and he knows Lulu by name. 
the return of her voice acted as a signal for him to awaken and offer guidance to the Zora warrior that he would meet, namely Link. Atop the back of the Great Turtle, the Hero of Time now has access and transit to the Great Bay Temple. It's time to cleanse it and save another giant. This facility is almost a factory, but what purpose it serves isn't really known. Maybe this place helps keep the oceans clean. To reach his goal, Link has to solve a complex system of water flow pipes, which creates a puzzling network that runs through the temple. Turning on certain mechanisms and controlling the direction of the water flow gradually opens up new areas. Here, a once guardian of the temple, Wart, rampages against Link, protecting a treasure that he needs to proceed, the Ice Arrow. From the morning of the second day, deep into the night, the hero struggles against this test of patience and planning, and this place truly is a test of the Hylian spirit to overcome. Finally, the hero reaches the chamber leading down into the heart of the temple and the lair of what now plagues the Great Bay. A massive sea beast called Georg has disturbed the waters of the sea and holds captive the third giant that Link seeks. This fight is a balance of finding his aim and acting quickly to follow up. Georg can be hit from a distance and stunned, but Link must enter the waters to continue his attack. But should Georg recover before Link can leave the pool, it will try to consume him. Through the dark hours of the night, the two fight it out in the depths of the temple. Georg even takes the hero down a few times before finally Link ends the monstrosity. Georg will no longer pollute the waters of the Great Bay, nor hold captive the guardian of this region. Link claims the mask that once imprisoned the innocent spirit trapped by Georg, and again, he goes to have a brief conversation with them. Tattle no longer waits for the Guardian to speak. These creatures seem passive, unacting, unwilling to communicate fully. She screams to the giant that if they don't do something, then something terrible will happen. The only response she receives, though, is, help our friend. Tattle assumes this to mean they must free the final Guardian, but... What if instead there was a way to help Skull Kid? Tattle doesn't just let the Guardians make more requests, she issues one in return. She asks for a guarantee of cooperation, but the giant doesn't respond to it. They are sent back to the Great Bay. Now that the ocean has been restored, it's time for Mr. Turtle to get back to sleep, to watch over the oceans from his deep slumber. He's going to listen to Lulu's lovely singing a bit longer, and then back to bed with him. There is yet one land that has not been explored. Time is running out for this cycle. For a short time, Link gets to see Lulu back in her rightful place with the Indigo Goes, the full power of her voice restored. The Great Bay has calmed, things are returning to normal. Like the great turtle outside, Link can spare some time to just relax and enjoy the Zora's home. Walk the beaches of the bay, explore the cliff sides and caves. In the form of Mikau, he sits in with the Indiegogos for a practice session. But, well, this is the hard part. Undoing all of it. Return Lulu to her heartbreak. Bring Mikau back to live out what remains of his life. Let the great bay become murky and polluted again. It's how things must be. The monkey in the swamp will face torture, the Goron will suffer a freezing, creeping death on the mountain, Romani Ranch will be attacked at night, Lulu will again spend her days staring out at the sea, unspeaking. He can't save them all. He can't help them all. But out of desperation, Link goes to Clock Town at midnight on the final night. Three of the Guardians are free, so maybe that's enough to stop the moon. Link and Tattle confront the Skull Kid, things play out much the same as before. He plays the oath to order and calls the three free giants from the corners of Termina. The swamp, mountain, and ocean respond to the song. The three of them lift their hands to try holding back the moon, but it's not enough. He has no choice. It's time to go back to the dawn of the first day. Don't think about anything else, at least not right now. The last corner to be explored lies to the east. Ikana was once a bitter and violent place. Once. Well, it still is. Ikana is a harrowing, dead place that has been visible and promising danger for some time. Ikana Kingdom boasts a bloody history, best left to campfire speculations and the boogeyman tales of children. Going northmost takes Link to a graveyard, where Dampe the Graveyard Keeper roams and tends to the grounds where the Ikana royal family now rests. But at night, the dead come out to roam. It's frightening, even to him. Dampe never goes out at night. Never. A massive bone creature rests here, a long-dead captain called Skull Kita, who cannot rest peacefully in death due to his failings in battle long ago. 
But if Link can awaken and chase down Kida, engage him in combat and defeat him, then Skull Kida will tell him of his woes and that he has long awaited an order to rest, an order that he wishes he could give to his men as well. With Link besting him, Kida passes this request on to Link and asks permission to finally rest, a request that Link is of course all too happy to grant. Kida graciously gifts to him his captain's hat. This will allow Link to communicate with the dead soldiers of the Akana Kingdom, to issue them the order to cease their wandering and to rest. Night has fallen over the graveyard, Dampe has taken shelter indoors, and there are undead Ikana lying about the field. But while wearing that mask, none of them bother Link. They call him Captain and they give him respect. He orders a gaggle of them to open a particular gravesite that they're marching around. After all, if the Captain demands it, then they will obey. A small gauntlet lies beneath that grave, leading Link to a brightly colored stage guarded by a fearsome iron knuckle. They're just as lethal here as he remembers them in Hyrule, but why is an iron knuckle here guarding a stage? That seems unnecessary if not outright overkill. Upon its defeat, the curtains of the stage pull back revealing a stage and another foe. But this one doesn't act with hostility, rather he politely introduces himself. This one is named Flat, the brother of Sharp. They both once served the Akana royal family as composers, at least in life. Flat claims that Sharp sold his soul to the devil and locked him away here countless lifetimes ago. But Flat doesn't speak ill of his brother. He's angry with him, yes, but he's quite worried over Sharp as well. Flat gifts to Link the Song of Storms, a melody that contains the thousand years of tears and the thunderous power of his anger. This will cleanse the black, cursed soul of his brother. Do this for him. It is his only request before departing. The Poe Collector that Link knew from dark times within Hyrule acts as a gatekeeper to the heart of the valley, demanding that Link show them proof that he can at least see the spirits of the now haunted land, which Link doesn't actually have. The Poe Collector tells him that he must obtain a mask containing wandering spirits, which can be found near the ranch. But Link spent like two days running around the ranch. There were no weird haunted masks there. Unless they mean the Gorman brothers? Those two dolts that chased Kremia's cart through the backcountry. Link rides back to that road up to the ranch, and at dawn of the second day, he goes to see the two weirdos. They start insulting Link and his horse as soon as he's in sight. They have some pretty rich insults for two men that can barely dress themselves. They challenge him to a race and promise that they'll give him something nice if he wins. Unwilling to let them hee-haw their way through mockery towards his horse, Link agrees to the race. It's a bit like that time that he raced Mr. Ingo at Lon Lon Ranch back in Hyrule, except now there are two of them and the racetrack is a bit of a death trap. Perhaps that's intentional on the Gorman brothers' part or poor upkeep. What is clear though is that Link whips them, and staying true to their wager, the elder Gorman brother rewards Link with the Garrow's Mask, something that was worn by ninja spirits? How did the Gorman brothers get something like this? Returning to Ikana, the Poe Collector is gleeful that Link has the mask. They tell him that it was the mask of a ninja clan leader who once spied on the hilltop castle with the blood-stained history. And if he wears it, maybe he'll be able to draw out the spirits who still wander here. Further into Ikana territory, in the heart of the canyon, there's more life to be found. First is a shady, prancing character that never stops smiling. He's chosen a strange place to call home. He doesn't care that the ghosts and undead are rising. He likes it here because there aren't any other people nearby, except a father-daughter duo who are farther up the hillside. And oh boy, does he like Link's sword. In fact, he would like to borrow it. As if I was born yesterday, prancing man. You know what we know about men that never stop smiling? Don't trust them as far as you can dropkick them. Tattle warns Link that she senses a thirst for blood nearby. It's a powerful presence, but it's not visible. Donning the Garros mask brings a fetid spirit out of hiding. One of the Akana's ancient foes, an assassin, they greet Link, believing him to be a superior, but quickly take up arms against him when the treachery is sniffed out. The Gara once bathed these hills in blood. Not even death could halt their hatred for the Akana. But the Gara are not without honor. In fact, when bested by Link, they will admit their fault and offer Link bits of advice and history before they burn their own body away to leave no trace of their self behind. There's a music box house in the abandoned village atop the butte, and there's no sound coming from it, which would seem to be the whole purpose behind a music box, right? 
There's a water wheel attached to it, but no water flowing. The riverbed is dry, and it's surrounded by Gipdos just endlessly circling the house. It stands to reason that the water wheel needs to be running to support the music box. But actually, standing back and taking in this entire scene, why is this house here in this dead land? Who would ever want to call this place home? There's danger around every corner. Link follows the dried riverbed into a nearby cavern to search for clues and any obstructions that would be blocking fresh water flow. His snooping brings Link face to face with a ghastly feigned called Sharp. Yes, that Sharp, brother of the Poe Flat, who invites Link to join the ranks of the dead with a composition of his own making. Hopefully Flat knew what he was talking about, because Sharp's melody will quickly kill Link should the Song of Storms fail. In a moment of faith, the hero plays for Sharp the Song of Storms. It sends the Poe nosediving. He cannot believe what he's hearing. It momentarily banishes him from Link's presence, and water once again pours forth from the cavern. This causes the water mill on that house to resume its churning, and the music box built onto the top of the home begins to blare its tune. The music box acted as a defense against the undead in the area. The Gibdo that were hounding its exterior are driven away as soon as it returns. Now freed from his curse, Sharp returns and acknowledges what he's done. He says that he'd done it because he so desperately wished to revive the Akana royal family. He would drain the life of everything in this canyon to bring them back. And he'd taken over this canyon and stopped the flow of water because a masked one had deceived him. But now he sees how terribly wrong he was. His curse is undone and the lies of the masked one have been revealed. Sharp asks of Link to find the temple of this land and to sever the root of evil that torments those who remain. To reach the temple, Link must first find the king within Akana Castle, who also suffers a curse in death, who awaits the coming of the one who will break it. Sharp may now leave this place to find his brother and his peace now that his final request has been made. A child was in that house. She's completely on her own. She quietly creeps out of the house in this dead land and stares at the newly flowing water. The Gibdo that were stalking the home are gone. She can leave it again. Link tries to run up to the girl to chat, but she bolts back into her home and locks the door as soon as she spots him. She's jumpy, still frightened. So he gives the house some space and watches the girl come back out and walk up a nearby hill towards a massive water well. Rather than stalk her around, Link takes the opportunity to sneak into the house that she just left to see what the deal is with this place. And it seems empty. There's no way a little girl could be in Akana Canyon alone. Something here is certainly not right. Downstairs, Link takes a look around and notices a door is moving on a closet. It's worth investigating. Something is in there. Inside is a man half transformed into a Gibdo. That little girl had this thing locked up, but who is it? What is it? It starts walking towards Link with its arms outstretched, but Tattle asks Link if he can instead heal its heart. Playing the Song of Healing reveals that this man, he truly was in the thrall of something sinister. The little girl ran back to the house when she heard her father's roars, and the two are reunited. He had no idea what he was doing, what happened to him, but it doesn't matter. The father and daughter completely ignore Link. The hero takes the mask that was cast away from the man after the Song of Healing, a Gibdo mask that will allow him to speak to the brutes. But now is not the time to question them or investigate what happened. Link and Tyler leave the parent and child time to recover from their shock. Instead, it's time to go see what's at the bottom of that water well. At the bottom of the deep, dark well, there are Gibdo all over the place. Wearing the mask, Link is able to speak to each one, and each one will make a demand for something before it will move. It forces Link to go out and collect a number of odds and ends around Termina to make his way through this fresh hellscape of a labyrinth. It takes him hours of travel and combat to satisfy every Gibdo blocking his path, but the reward for this is certainly worth the effort. He finds the mirror shield at the end of the watery well. It opens up a secret passage that connects the water well to another previously unreachable place, the courtyard of Ikana Castle. Sharp had said that the king was awaiting one who could break his curse, and that doing so would lead him to the temple of this land. The castle is infested with the dead, and after countless years abandoned and hollow, it's decayed into rubble and rot. This was once a splendorous place, an empire to be feared, now occupied by corpses and memories of violence. The Garo that Link brings out of hiding give him hints on how to proceed through the castle and how to face the Great King once he reaches his throne room. 
it would serve Link well to listen to their wise words. Igos du Ukana died with his kingdom, yet he still sits upon his throne. His guardians never left his side, not even in death. Link should expect a brawl, expect them to do whatever it takes to kill him in that throne room. Igos du Ukana himself led an empire that nearly toppled this land. He could possibly be the most dangerous thing in this canyon. It's fate's fortune that the Garrow and Ikana destroyed one another, and Link is not here to choose sides or fight ancient wars for dead kings. If any oppose him, he will fight them. He enters the ancient throne room, ready to face down one of the deadliest beings in all of Termina. Igos de Ikana does not move against Link. He doesn't need to. It's below him. His guardians begin this fight by shrouding the room in darkness and racing towards the boy. The Garrow had warned him to not allow them their shade, so he burns away the decrepit curtains blocking out the light and finds the weakness of these ancient beings, sunlight. They cannot stand to be in it. It harms them like nothing else. The two guardians ruthlessly strike out at the hero from the shadows, refusing to draw in too close and instead forcing him to dance about them in combat. His goal is to lure them towards the light so that he can reflect it upon them with his shield. And it's no quick affair. The two are hard to land hits on and will come to each other's aid should Link get the upper hand. But when finally they each fall and Link burns away their corpses, Igos de Ikana draws his sword and shield and begins the fight anew against the exhausted hero. He's a powerful combatant and can detach his head from his body, forcing Link to deal with him on two fronts. The ancient king nearly succeeds in cutting the boy down, ending his life, but by a hair's breadth, Link manages to bring Igos du Ikana down, casting away the evil curse that clouded his mind. With his vision and thoughts cleared, in the moments before he finally leaves this world, Igos du Ikana reflects upon his old life and the fall of his kingdom. There was so much hatred, so much chaos and bloodshed, but after somebody thrust open the gates of the stone tower, their need for violence sprang forth again, and the canyon fell into the sad state that it is now. It is thanks to Link that the spell binding them is broken. To return the light to this land, Egos tells Link that he must seal the doors of the stone tower, defeat whatever is inside, and lock that place away once again. It's the only way. While hundreds of his own soldiers could not conquer that place, perhaps the lone warrior before him does stand a chance. To help him, Egos teaches Link the Elegy of Emptiness, a terrible song that will grant him a soldier who has no heart. Should Link need another to stand in his place, he may use this melody to create a single copy of each of his forms. Four empty soldiers in total. He will need this ability to reach the final temple. Egos Duikana passes from this plane, his final request being for Link to shine the light of justice upon his kingdom. It's almost impossible to feel regret with the end of this cycle. It's the final day, and so much has been accomplished, but the memories of Ikana Canyon, those are best left in the past, so to speak. That girl and her father in the music box, they could be helped once again on his passage through, but that water well, the derelict castle, the undead and skeletal soldiers, the Garrow, they're all things perhaps best forgotten. There is yet one more obstacle that he must face. He's seen it far off in the distance time and time again, that massive stone tower. Even knowing precisely where to go and being fully equipped for the climb, it takes Link almost all of his remaining time just to reach the entrance of the Stone Tower Temple. It's no wonder an army couldn't topple this place. Just having to worry about his own height is hard enough. Imagine trying to get a hundred or more men to scale this place. It would be impossible. He will need all the time he can get in this place, so the hero rewinds time and uses the Gift of the Owl statues to fly back to the Stone Temple. The temple itself, strangely enough, is occupied by machinations and creatures that seem to belong here, which makes one wonder, was the Skull Kid incapable of entering this place and really corrupting it? As that's interesting. And though it doesn't reek of Majora's curses, the place is still exceedingly dangerous. While the temple itself may still stand intact, as dictated by the flow of time, that doesn't change the fact that a guardian was imprisoned here. It requires the use of all Link's shell soldiers to make his way through. And if that seems tiresome, remember this. If real beings had been here, an army, if they had been used to open these paths, then they would have been trapped once the others had made their way through, left behind, abandoned, with no way to get through. 
It's one of the many security measures that keeps meddlers out of this temple. Dormant creatures made of stone and metal awaken when Link draws in too close. Dangerous combatants that guard doors and pathways. But most curious that Link should meet a still living being here, a Garrow master in flesh and blood. And as soon as he sees Link in the tower, he attacks. There is no explanation for why he is here or why he so ruthlessly attacks. That is not the way of the Garrow. His tendency to charge with fire-infused weapons makes him a far greater threat than his underlings that hide in the shadow. But upon his defeat, the Garrow Master tells Link a secret. The temple can be rearranged, up and down, made in verse. And he tells Link precisely how to do it before ending his own life with a bomb, ensuring that no corpse be left behind. After all, that is the way of the Garrow. The death of the Master reveals a hidden treasure that Link will need to conquer this place, the Light Arrow. And following the instructions of the fallen Garrow Master, Link is able to flip the temple on its head from the outside, opening up new branches and paths previously unreachable. And as before, all of his forms are required to navigate through this labyrinth. Another questionably alive being greets Link en route to the heart of the temple, a Reaper-akin creature called Gomis that is only made vulnerable with the use of the Light Arrow. It guards the master key of this tower, but the story of Gomez is a complete mystery. It existed here to safe keep this treasure, but Link cuts it down after a bitter fight and claims the treasure for himself. If past experiences have taught him anything, it's that obtaining this key means that Link is close to the end of his journey here. But deeper into the temple is an unexpected surprise of sorts. A fierce creature guards a door forward, not unique, but what is revealed when Link kills it is most interesting. It's a mask, the giant's mask. And why is this beast guarding it? Why is there a mask here? When Link tries to put it on, it doesn't do anything. It seems useless, but it is a strange thing to find. But the end is finally near. It's taken nearly a day and a half to reach the massive locked door containing whatever curses this land. Throwing it open reveals that a fall is required, a plunge into something unseeable. When Link takes that leap, he lands someplace impossible, as though he's in a completely new land, taken far away from the Stone Temple Tower, placed into the middle of an endless desert, where the ground shakes to greet his arrival. Great twin insects called the Twin Mold are here, massive creatures that seem impossible to even approach. Their arena is far too big to cross on foot, and they move at such speed that Link can barely get a clean shot on them. But that giant's mask, he can put it on here, so that's why it was hidden and under guard, a method to handle the Twin Mold. Now large enough to face them head-on, the challenge has become learning to control his oversized body and land hits on the tail or head of each worm. But their constant movement and shielding of their weak points, it still makes it an extremely difficult fight. And to add further complication to the process, the mask drains Link's magic. He can't use it forever. And after a long, grueling game of chase and slash, he's forced back down to his original size, to fight on foot. And it's not impossible to do. He could absolutely kill the Twin Mold with just his bow and arrow. But the accuracy that that would require would be phenomenal, and he does not have the speed to gather resources around this massive field in this form. He's able to bolt from magic pots and arrows, take his giant form back, and push on with the battle. One of the Twin Mold goes down, but the other is still healthy. It lunges at him through the ground, flies through the air, blocks his attacks with his carapace, and destroys his sources of magic and arrows as it flies about. Just before night of the second day, with only half a heart remaining, he succeeds. Link has felled the Twin Mold. The final of the four is finally destroyed, leaving behind a mask that once imprisoned the spirit that kept this temple. With this task finally completed, it's time to greet the last of the giants. This one, too, urges Link and Tattle to call upon them. They've experienced enough to know precisely what this means. When the time comes, at midnight on the final night, the melody taught to Link by the first of the giants they saved must be played. That song, Oath to Order. It served no purpose other than this. When it's time, Link and Tattle must have faith in that melody and in the actions of the four together. The fate of Termina will rest in what they do. For now, it's time for them to go back to the Ikana Canyon, back to where they belong. The gloom that lingered over the ancient kingdom is banished with the destruction of the Twin Mold and the freeing of the last giant. It's not such a bad place with all the evil banished. When Link gets back to Clock Town, it's deep into the night of the second day. 
He could choose to continue on to greet the final day and begin his confrontation with the Skull Kid atop the clock tower, but there are a few errands that he would like to see to first. Masks that he has heard of, but he hasn't found yet. So once more, Link rewinds time back to the first day. It's bright and early, 6 a.m., time to get busy. But something draws Link's eye. It's a kid wearing a mask coming out of the water pool area. He's seen that kid before, but he's always just ran away from Link, refused to talk to him. What is his deal? Well, anyways, Link takes some time to play a game with the postman, say hello to Anju in the stockpot inn, and then rolls over to the mayor's office to see what's going on there. And there he greets the mayor's wife, Madame Aroma. She's kind of a new face to him. She's having a conversation with Toto, the manager for the Indiegogos. Madame Aroma politely greets Link and asks if he's the expert person finder that she hired, or rather, she assumes that he is. Her son, Cafe, has been missing for a month now. She has no idea where he went, he simply vanished without a trace. Madame Aroma gives Link a mask that will give him the authority to investigate Cafe's disappearance. And that mask... Oh my, that hair is familiar. Link saw someone that looked like this just this morning. It was that kid at the water pool across town. Link snoops about Cafe's room and he finds his journal. It says, a wedding ceremony is soon. It might be early, but I finished my wedding mask. I wonder if Angie made hers. She tends to do things at the last minute, so probably not. There's a gathering of the fellows at the milk bar tonight. I plan to show off my wedding mask and talk about my sweetheart as best I can. Oh, that's sweet. A wedding ceremony with Anju? Wait, Cafe's a kid. What the hell, Anju? Okay, well, hold on. Maybe Link was wrong. The kid wasn't Cafe. Asking the receptionist about the whole affair confirms that Cafe and Anju are engaged. It's public knowledge, so maybe Anju is the first person that he should see about this. Cafe seemed so in love with her in his diary. He wouldn't just vanish and not tell her, right? Seeing somebody wear this mask, it's a shock to Anju, but she quickly rebounds from it and carries on without a word on the topic. So, she won't be a lead. Who else could Link talk about this? Maybe the mayor? Maybe the captain of the guard? None of the entertainers upstairs have anything of interest to say. Well, this is a dead end. But, when leaving the inn, the postman arrives, carrying mail for Anju, and her reaction is quite loud, enough so that it catches Link's attention. Anju tries to ask the postman where he got this letter from, what mailbox, who sent it, but like a strangely stoic professional, he doesn't crack. That's not information that he can disclose, not even to her. Once again, approaching her with Cafe's mask, Anju begs Link for assistance in the matter. She asks him to come back to the inn later that night for a private meeting in the kitchen, and there she can explain more. Well, this cycle just got a lot more interesting. So, he has the rest of the day to listen to stories from Anju's grandmother, play a few games at the local shops, meet another Goron named Link, and after night falls and the inn locks up for the night, he sneaks back in through an unlocked door on the second floor. And sure enough, just before midnight, Anju creeps into the kitchen for their meeting. The letter she received was from Cafe himself, and she would like for Link to act as an intermediary between them. She doesn't know where he went or if he's in trouble, but she's afraid of what's happened. She has her own letter to send to Cafe, but she's afraid of doing it, so she asks Link to do it for her, and then he'll be able to meet Cafe. Link agrees to take this burden from her and to find out what has happened to her fiancé. The first step will be delivering that letter before dawn. Easy enough. So he drops off that letter and he waits for the dawn of the second day, though he's not really sure what he's waiting for. Maybe the mailman to collect the letter? That, that makes sense. How long is that going to take, though? When is he supposed to come back? Well, that kid came from the laundry pool, and there was a door in the laundry pool that he could never get through, so he decides to go to the laundry pool and just wait behind a tree for the rest of the day. It is deep into the afternoon by the time the postman arrives. He rings a bell, and the purple-haired kid runs out to greet him. The two have a brief exchange before the kid bolts back into his hideaway. This time, though, he leaves the door unlocked. It's time to go see what's going on in there. And this kid, he says that the letter Andrew wrote said that Link could be trusted, so he's going to tell him a secret. He's Cafe, all three feet of him. Ooh, yikes. This is really, really complicated. Complicated, but not problematic. The school kid did this to Cafe not long before his wedding. He tried to get help from the Great Fairy in North Clocktown. 
but on his way there, somebody ambushed him and stole his wedding mask. A grinning, prancing man. Cathay is good friends with the pawn shop owner in town, and he knows that stolen items tend to wind up there, so with his friend's permission, he's been held up here watching out for anybody that would come through with his wedding mask. And Link has met a man that fits that description in Econa Canyon. He really wanted to borrow Link's sword, if memory serves. It's certainly possible, if not likely, that he is the culprit, that he targeted Cafe because he was a kid and couldn't fight back. Cafe will remain here, watching for the weird man to walk into the pawn shop. Link will go give Anju a pendant. It will serve as a promise to her, one that she'll understand. It's a promise that Cafe will return soon, that he has not abandoned her, and he certainly hasn't forgotten her. Receiving this is such a relief to the poor woman. It makes her so happy, and she tells Link that she has decided she will wait for him. Her mother and grandmother are preparing to flee the town, but Andrew will not go with them. Here she will stay until Cafe reappears. Early the next day, Link decides to go talk to Cafe to give him the good news, tell him what Andrew said, but when he arrives, the door is locked. Cafe doesn't answer. So maybe this is just the end of this particular mission? They failed? Time to give up, perhaps? Andrew doesn't say anything about Cafe reappearing, so did he just really vanish on her? Right before their wedding? That would be terrible. Later on in the afternoon, Link comes back one more time, just to see. And to his surprise, the door opens. But it isn't Cafe that's inside. It's the pawn shop owner. This guy always seemed as shady as the forest, and he's been fairly unpleasant to deal with. I mean, the guy does business with thieves. But he was also a good friend of Cafe's, and he wants to help the guy out. He gives Link one of his own masks, the Keaton mask, just because he seems nice. He likes the kid, and that's all the reason that he needs. So maybe the pawn shop owner isn't such a bad guy deep down. He also asks Link to deliver some express mail to Cafe's mother, probably to tell her about what's happened to him. But where did Cafe himself go? What did happen to him? The shop owner tells Link that a thief went into his shop the other night to pawn something, and Cafe had a full-on rage-fueled episode. He took off after the thief, probably back to his shelter. The thief is named Seiken, and his hideout is indeed in Akana. So it was that guy, that happy prancing let me borrow your sword for a minute guy. Cafe decided to go handle this himself. Oh no, Cafe, what are you getting yourself into? Madame Aroma is nowhere to be seen, and the day is drawing to a close, the final day. There's not much time left. Link decides to make a run for the canyon, to where he knows the thief Seiken hangs out. Maybe he can find a solution to all of this there. Running up the river leads the hero to a sealed off lair, marked with a sign designated as Sagan's hideout. Not very discreet, but Sagan also doesn't seem like the brightest of bulbs either. Good news is, Cafe isn't around yet, so Link has managed to beat him here. Link decides to hide behind some nearby rubble to wait for any activity, because somebody has to appear here eventually, and he'll wait as long as he possibly can for that to happen. Finally, after night falls, it's Cafe who appears, thank goodness. The two meet up behind the rubble to discuss his plan. They're going to wait for Seiken to return, let the thief open the locked doors, and then rush in after him to get the mask back. It's a pretty solid plan. It's one worth waiting out. And one hour later, Cafe is again proven right about the thief. He arrives right as expected and opens the door to his hideout, leaving it wide open. And Cafe doesn't miss a beat. His precious mask is sitting atop a conveyor belt in the middle of a warehouse. Who knows what else Sagan has stowed away here? And Cafe, ah, oh, almost immediately sets off the hideout security system, locking down the doors, turning on the defenses within each room, and starting the conveyor belt with his valuable mask atop it. If they can't reach the end of the belt before the mask, it will be dumped out of reach. They're on a time limit now to solve each of the puzzles in the rooms. They have to work together, with one opening the door for the other. Link takes the combat heavy side, whilst Cafe takes the puzzle oriented gauntlet. Each of them have to make it through all of the rooms and stand atop a deactivation switch at the back of the lair. If one of them fails, they both fail. But together they manage to make it through. Each of them reach their switch and stop the conveyor belt from dumping Cafe's wedding mask. Time is running out. It's just past midnight. If they both run, they can make it back to Clock Town just before the end. Link is able to soar back quickly landing back in Clocktown. It gives him just enough time to find Cafe's mother, Madame Aroma, to deliver that special letter, to let her know what became of her son. She chose to spend her final moment at the Milk Bar Latte, sitting alone with only the bartender around. She looks every bit like a heartbroken mother. Delivering Cafe's letter to her is a comfort she desperately needed. It's far too late to escape what's to come, 
but at least she can face it knowing that her son was alive and trying to get back home. And next is Andrew. Link goes to where she's waiting, and he sits with her, silently, hoping that Cafe makes it. With only one hour to spare, Cafe does make it back to Andrew. But seeing him in the body of a child, it's not easy to accept. They were supposed to be wed, but this wasn't her groom. Setting aside her tears, Andrew greets and accepts Cafe. Even if he's not the same, she's gentle with her words. She knows his scent from their childhood. So long ago, they agreed to marry each other on the eve of the carnival. There's no way that can happen now, but they decide to exchange masks and to gift Link their couple's mask. It's a thank you for reuniting them and for witnessing this event. This regretful tale is at its end, at least for Andrew and Cathay. This is where their lives will otherwise end. With the moon falling fast, they cannot take refuge. Instead, they decide that they will stay here a little bit longer and greet whatever the morning brings. And it's too late for Link to go and confront Majora. The clock is ticking. He won't make it there in time. Andrew and Cathay had but a few heavy-hearted moments together. It's time to rewind time and undo it all. This is it. This is the final cycle. Midnight on the final day, he will climb the clock tower and he will confront the Skull Kid. Confront Majora. End this madness.